Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 21st, 2017, and my guest is Elizabeth Pape, founder of the clothing company Elizabeth Suzanne. Our topic for today is the world of clothing, the challenge of a startup, and the role, the role that pricing plays in the clothing industry today. Liz, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Now, you wrote a very provocative and extremely interesting blog post on your company's uh, website that we're going to talk about in some detail uh, in this later part of this conversation. We'll link to that blog post. But I want to start with some background on you and your company. Uh, how did you get started with Elizabeth Suzanne? And describe what, what the company uh, produces and sells. So um, Elizabeth Suzanne is uh, the clothing company that I own. Um, we essentially produce women's wear. Um, we aren't necessarily a fashion brand. We don't release seasonal collections. Uh, we produce basics that are made from all natural fibers and we do everything made to order from our Nashville studio. Um, so we're pretty unconventional in terms of how we make clothes, um, and the kinds of things that we make, but in terms of the aesthetics of the brand, we're, we're pretty simple, pretty minimal. Um, we really focus on the craftsmanship of the product and the story of the pieces that we sell. So, um, I didn't set out to start a clothing company (laughs) by any means. Um, I was a liberal arts major in college, uh, didn't study design, just knew how to sew kind of as a hobby. And um, we moved to Nashville for my husband to attend school. And I did it, was working working on clothing just kind of as a way to make some extra money on the side. Um, Ended up with a product that uh, seemed to be pretty popular with customers and just kind of followed that to where we are today. What Uh, What was that first product? Uh, the first product that was really popular was the Georgia tee. It's just a very, very, probably the simplest thing we sell, a very simple t-shirt um, made in linen. We now offer it in a few other fabrics, but it's just a very basic kind of universal top. And when you started, you just made one and tried to sell it or you made a bunch? <laughs> how, how did, it, yeah. you know, you say you like to sew and you found yourself in Nashville. <laughs> how did that go from that to like, like taking in money? Um, I was selling on Etsy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it's like an online marketplace, uh, for people making things by hand started there, got pretty popular, just kind of in that little community, but, um, really started gaining traction when I would, I would do in-person vendor events. So there would be like a, 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 you might have them in your city, a a local kind of pop-up fair where people come and set up booths and sell their products. Um, I did a few of those just really on a whim. Some of my friends were doing them and, um, I just figured I'd try it out. And the first one I did, I made maybe a couple thousand dollars, maybe like three grand. And I, to me at the time, I was like, holy cow, I could like pay rent, you know, with this How many, <laughs> in a week. What were you selling you know? it for at the time? Um, prices were pretty similar to where they are today. It was maybe 120 bucks for a, for a shirt. <clears throat> um, so at the time that, that being able to sell that much product in a weekend was inspiring to me. So I just kind of kept doing it. Um, went to New York and Chicago to do some more vendor events like that and sort of grew the customer base that way. So then those people that I'd met in person uh, would continue to shop online from the site. And then the customer base just kind of grew in a grassroots way. So in those early days when you were showing up at that craft event with a stack of shirts, (laughs) right? You had no idea how many you're going to sell. You took, you probably sold out sometimes I assume, or did you just take 40 shirts and hope and just sit there and in advance and make 40 shirts? And how long did it take you to make one in those days? I I was definitely slower back then. I would make maybe five or six garments in a full, like full day of work. Um, But I would essentially just make as much as I could right up until the event. So if I, if I signed up for a show a month out, I'd make as many things, you know, I'd, I'd also be limited by how much I could afford to buy. Um, so if I had, you know, 500 bucks to spend on fabric, that's sort of what would limit limit me there. But um, I would make just as much as I <laughs> as I could kind of afford to, um, given my money and time at, at the time. And usually would sell out, um, most shows would sell out of 
most popular products. That's that's cool. So when was that? That was in the very end of 2013. So is really when I kind of started selling things. After I did a few events, I picked a name, picked Elizabeth Suzanne, and then actually started to treat it a little more like a real thing rather than just a side kind of cash project. Um, so that was the very end of 2013. And when did you hire your first employee? Uh, about f- a few months right after that, um, very early 2014, I had an intern, uh, unpaid intern, and she helped cutting and packing orders, that kind of stuff. Um, and then she became my first paid employee and was with us. She actually just left, just moved to Seattle. Um, so has been with us for about three years. So over the last three years, tell us what's happened. So you started off making, you had one one employee yourself, really. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were self-employed and you were making your own t-shirts. Um, it's $120 t-shirts. So I, I guess you have to, I'm wearing, I just, I'm going to confess, I'm wearing, I think about a $5 t-shirt right now, which <laughs> is a, okay. a, an incredible contrast to, to what, uh, to your clothing line. And it's a perfect counterpoint to your concerns that we're going to be raising later. It's a, it's a synthetic shirt. I bought it at Costco. I have no <laughs> idea who made it or how it was made. But when you started, You were one person making T-shirts and a high-end T-shirt, obviously. But then tell us what's happened over the last three years. And everybody, of course, can go to ElizabethSuzanne.com. We'll put a link up to it and check out the clothing line. But give us a rough description of of the range of stuff that you're selling now and and what's happened to your growth, the employees, and so on. Yeah. So we started out, you know, just like I was saying, kind of in small shows and with an Etsy shop, once traffic started to pick up and we were getting steady orders each week, my husband helped me make a very simple website. Um, he is not a developer. He's just handy with the internet. So he helped me set up a site, um, outside of Etsy and, Uh, I just kind of brought people on one at a time. So brought on a part-time seamstress in the beginning. I was selling every piece myself, doing all the photography, all of the copywriting, running social media, doing all of that on my own. So the first thing that I hired out was the actual production of the garment. So I'd bring in part-time sewers into the studio with me. They'd, they'd be sewing orders while I was kind of working on developing new products and, and running the rest of the business. So pretty quickly we, I added, um, additional items, very, very simple, most of which we still sell today. Um, and essentially it was just kind of a snowball, a snowball, uh, effect, um, added on two part-time sellers in that first studio space was there for about six months and then had to move to a, a larger warehouse. So in 2014, we moved to about a 2000 square foot warehouse in Nashville, um, while we were there, the team grew from myself, our intern, and two part-time sewers to a team of 10, um, most of which were full-time. And then pretty quickly uh, after moving into that building, we realized we needed to move again. So uh, very early uh, 2015, we moved to our current facility, which is a 10,000 square foot warehouse in Nashville. Um, and now we are at a team of, I believe, 21, just added a new hire last week. Um, so we've grown pretty quickly, uh, really just added employees kind of one one person at a time as the job needed to be filled. Um, I First thing we started outsourcing was, like I said, the manufacturing and production. Now we've got some customer support staff, some media staff. Uh, my husband handles the finance and kind of administrative stuff. So we've finally started hiring out more than just the production side of things. Um, but everything, of product, but everything, everything you sell is made in that Nashville studio, correct? Correct. Yes. It, and we, made by the people, the night, the 21, the 21 people, not everyone, tw- all, not all 21 touch a, a needle obviously, or touch fabric, but the, you're using 21 folks in one location to create, uh, talk about some of the things that you, that you sell now. Yes, absolutely. Every single thing that we sell is made in that building. Um, so we still do just women's wear. Um, it's, a range that is now developed into three different collections. We've got a, a year round collection called our signature collection that essentially is comprised of pieces that we release and customers sort of deem their favorites. They're their best sellers, our most popular pieces. We keep those indefinitely. So we've still got the Georgia tea there from three years ago. And if a piece comes out this year, that's popular, um, it'll move into the signature collection. So customers will know I'll always be able to get that classic pair of pants or that classic shirt from, from that collection. And then we have 
two kind of weather centric collections, a warm weather collection and a cold weather collection that we update each uh, year with new pieces kind of intended for those climates. So we sell, we do a little bit of outerwear, some coats, a few wool products, but predominantly linen, uh, linen, cotton and silk tops and bottoms and dresses. Very basic, but suitable to be dressed up and dressed up or down. Everything's washable. So we've got a lot of um, a lot of professional customers, a lot of moms, a lot of travelers, people who need clothes that are really, really hardworking and easy to wear, but um, are super versatile for for different uses. Were you scared along the way? <laughs> I mean, you've, you've expanded in a in a thoughtful, non crazy way. It seems you didn't go out and hire twenty people the first week and think I'm going to be a big success. You you've I think you said on the website you financed it all yourself. You didn't borrow money. You have no outside investors, so you've been pretty um, thoughtful about it. It seems to me. Have you been? Were there scary times? Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think. Our, the, our, our growth has been pretty organic and that has certainly helped. Like you said, I didn't decide to launch a clothing line and have to, you know, pitch a big idea and hope it worked. Um, we predominantly made decisions or made moves or added people when there was an obvious need. Um, so we usually kind of knew, okay, we're about to, you know, hire a person full time and pay their salary, but we're hiring them because we need them. We've got, we've got orders to, to sustain it, but there have absolutely been quite a few scary moments. I think, uh, our first, our move to the, to our current facility was probably, probably one of the bigger ones. You know, we found our, moved into this building because we knew we needed the space, but a, a shift from 2000 square feet to 10 is a pretty big yeah. one. And, um, you know, <laughs> committing to pay that bill, yeah. you really, you really, you, you, you have the orders, you know, in September, but are you going to have the orders next January? So, um, we've, we've definitely felt some fear there. I think I'm pretty pretty prone to taking risks. I would say my husband is more of that kind of sensible one uh, in terms of talking me off the ledge sometimes, but uh, I really like to take risks. I do find myself second guessing them kind of right after I've pulled the trigger <laughs> when it's a little too late. But so far, nothing awful has happened. Um, I do think we're, we're getting to the point now where our staff is growing and has some pretty, some pretty legitimate HR needs that are, are pretty difficult to handle You know, as someone who has zero experience with that. Um, so I would say, yes, I'm certainly scared pretty often, but it hasn't, hasn't caused any serious damage yet. Well, I know you have yoga uh, during the day, so I'm sure that's helping calm you down. Because yeah. yes. uh, I read that on your website. Uh, is there a mistake you can share? You don't have to, but is there something that you regret, something that went just blew up that you didn't realize that surprised you? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, I, the one that's kind of top of mind right now uh, is our, our wool um, provider. So last year, which we're working through kind of our supply chain, um, ethics are at, at the top of, of every decision that I make. So the first thing that we addressed was obviously producing the clothing in-house. You know, the people who are making the clothing are in our building, we know how they're treated. It's an environment we're really proud of. We're kind of working backwards through the supply chain now. So we know how the garments are made. Let's figure out how the fabric is made. Um, so the first fabric we really prioritized in that kind of supply chain process was, was wool. Uh, it's the one I feel the most strongly about because they're actual, you know, living, living animals involved in providing the raw material for that fabric. And lots of, lots of wool production is really, really inhumane and unethical. So we, I really wanted to find a domestic provider for the raw material of the wool that I could go visit, see how the operation is run, make sure that I'm kind of on board with the process and then find a domestic facility to manufacture the fabric. So a ranch will provide the raw material and then a, it'll, that material will be spun into yarn and dyed. And then that yarn will be woven into fabric. So we, it's a pretty ambitious project. Uh, companies like Patagonia and Island Fisher have been trying to do this for years. Um, and in hindsight, <laughs> I don't really know why we thought we'd be able to do it so quickly, but essentially we gave ourselves about six months to completely build up a, a, an entirely new wool supply chain. So we, we did find a ranch um, out in Oregon. We found a stock ranch that had excellent, excellent standards. We went on and visited, loved the owners, um, really loved the product. We're very happy with the source of the material. Uh, and then worked with a weaver here in Nashville to actually create the finished fabric for us. Um, and ultimately they were unable to deliver. They were a pretty small operation. She obtained investment based on our purchase order 
and based on us, you know, saying we're going to, yeah. we're going to transition all of our world to you. And essentially the operation just kind of crumbled under the demand. You know, we needed yep. about a thousand, a thousand yards of wool and, uh, it, it never got delivered, but uh, the the real mistake on our part <laughs> was that we we took orders for the product sure. before we had the fabric in the building. Reasonable, so, sort of, kind of, but yeah. 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 So our, our big lesson there was to really be careful and make sure that we're working with operations that are at least as big as we are. Um, and then, of course, never taking a customer's dollar until we are sure so you <laughs> that got the we product, yeah. send out the product. So we've been kind of recovering from that. Um, it was a really huge story that we promoted and published and um, we're really, really proud of and passionate about. And then it just kind of fell out right out from under us. But Interesting. Now, uh, how do you market your retail line other than appearing on Econ Talk, which is going to be huge. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's going to be great. You know, it's going to have an enormous, you're going to see a huge spike. People are going <laughs> to, when they write the history of your company and do the documentary or the the, the um, Netflix series, are going to say, what happened in in April of 2007? Oh, that was the Econ Talk episode. Okay. Yes, but other than that, um, how do you reach people? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have a super clear answer because we are still still kind of trying to figure this out ourselves, h- how people find us. Um, in the beginning, it was pretty exclusively grassroots. You know, I would meet people in person and they would literally tell a friend. Um, and I'm still blown away by how well that worked and how, how many people actually talked about, you know, this tiny, non-existent company. Um, today, our primary efforts are focused on our current customer base. So we still we still kind of take that angle. So we try really hard to keep our current customers extremely happy um, and really well taken care of and give them a reason to talk about us to other people. We do not do a lot of retargeting. We do not do, you know, Google ads. We don't, we, we are not trying to capture new customers. We are trying to keep our current customers really, really pleased and let them tell new customers about us. So the way we do that is primarily by focusing on education. Um, we do not put out kind of empty content. If we're going to send a newsletter, it needs to have something that was going to that is going to add value to our customers' lives. Um, we really, just, really, yeah. You're not just like knocking on the door. Hey, I'm here. Don't forget about me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, exactly. Which I understand is a useful, you know, advertising technique, but. Yeah, it does work. Um, but we think that the long term investment um, of really creating loyal, really friends, um, in our customers is going to give us the, the biggest payoff, um, in the long run. And it's also, you know, what I feel good about doing. I don't want to add crap to people's lives. So, um, we just really want to try to make sure that we're always adding value, always providing education or information, and then essentially creating marketing that is going to have, have a life cycle of its own. So if we can publish a post like, like this money, uh, post, that is going to give people a reason to share it and a reason to to talk about it on their own. Um, that marketing will usually be significantly more effective because it just can exponentially grow. Uh, not many people are inclined to just share a, a pretty photo of a dress. Yeah. So, one more question before we start to get to the the pricing issues that you wrote about. Uh, can you give us a feel for how many pieces of clothing you might? I don't want to go into your proprietary business, but some idea of what the scope of your operation is for those of us who don't do a lot of sewing. And of course, not all of your 21 employees are, are making product. Um, are we talking about hundreds of t-shirts, thousands? Of course, you have, you have all these, you have tops, you have bottoms, you have outer wear sweaters, some coats, some shoes, boots. Is it thousands of pieces a month, hundreds? Can you give just a just a vague idea of how big you are? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I'm I'm happy to you know share whatever information you think would be valuable. Our, um, I think we are producing right now about fifteen hundred units a month. Um, we we produce kind of using weekly plans, and usually our weekly production plan is 250 to 300 units. Uh, but then we've got big spikes every time we release a new product. So we might have a 700 unit week or uh, 500 unit week. Um, so I would say between 1,000 and 1,500 a month uh, in terms of units. We have a pretty small customer base. We've got about I think 4,500 I think 4,500 active customers. 
um, those people just come back and keep buying. Um, so most of our business, I think 65% of our business is repeat customers who are just continuing to support the brand. Um, so I think our, our first year in business, not counting 2013 and 2014, we did, I think about 320,000 in sales. And then, uh, in 2015 did a million and then 2016 landed a little bit over 2 million. And then this year we're, we're projecting for three. So personal question, um, and again, without any, you don't have to give me the details, but uh, you seem to be good at providing details, so you're welcome to. Um, <laughs> it, do you? How much? What's your? Do you have a dream to be ten times bigger, three times bigger, just this size, or can you? Be, are you happy with the profit that you're making from this experience as a lifestyle serving 4,500 people? I mean, that's an amazing thing when I think about it. You know, in, two, in 1950 or 1980 or 1990, it'd be really hard to make a living selling to 40. You, you couldn't have found those 4,500 people before the internet, right? It, yeah. it just, it, this is a, <laughs> such a 2017, 21st century story. And especially, you know, given your price point and your um, just your production model, it, it's really quite extraordinary that you're, you seem to be thriving and um, are you happy like this? Do you want to be bigger, much bigger, a little bigger, smaller? Um, that's such a good question. I I think my husband and I personally are are very happy kind of with the lifestyle that the business is able to provide us with. Uh, we're certainly not getting rich, um, but we're able to do something that we love and live pretty comfortably. Um, I think in terms of long-term dreams, I, I don't see us growing to become a huge brand because our product is so niche. Um, I also think that growth beyond a certain point could start to hurt uh, our, our image. Um, I think people really like our brand because it feels like a discovery. It feels like we've, I found this really special company. I think the bigger we get, uh, we'll lose a little bit of that magic. Um, I think my primary goal is to provide a, a really, really, like transformative environment for our staff. So I'd like to grow to the point where we're able to build a new facility. We're, we're kind of in town right now. Um, I'd like to get out of Nashville a little bit and build a really excellent facility where we can really optimize our manufacturing process, have everything set up really, truly perfectly for our business model, um, have some greenery, lots of natural light, be able to have childcare on the premises, perhaps provide you know, food that's kind of grown on site. I'd love to kind of create this ecosystem um, for the people who who run the brand. I I don't know if there's like a, a cap on our growth, but I don't see us growing to be ten times our current size. I don't I don't think that would be um, the same company, and I don't know if I am cut out to run <laughs> an operation quite that large. I'm just curious how you're cut out to run this one. Um, <laughs> And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean, you, you confessed you're a liberal arts major. You've had to figure out a ton of stuff, um, right? Do you sit yeah. up at night reading uh, books on um, supply chain and, and manufacturing and uh, price points, marketing, or do you just kind of – are you just kind of winging it? Um, you're doing a, a great job, it. but I <laughs> – no, I, I completely understand. I, I feel that way myself. I feel like an imposter uh, quite a bit. Um, the thing that I set up reading the most about is managing people. I think the, the supply chain and the manufacturing part, that, oh, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not easy. But those things are easier for me to figure out. Um, I, I think researching is a really, a, a really great skill of mine, finding the kind of best product, the best machine, the best table. All of those things are, are puzzles that I really enjoy solving. Um, and then marketing is just kind of an instinct. I just try to do things that, that I want to hear about or see. Um, that's really my kind of litmus test is, do I like this? And so far that seems to be working pretty well. Um, managing people is definitely not, uh, natural to me. And I, I definitely struggle with how to kind of lead a team and how to transition from the kind of startup phase where everybody really needs to have a, a lot of grit and tenacity to be able to get through those extremely long days and then finding out how to transition those people 
into places where they're going to be happy as more structure needs to be put into place. You know, now that we've grown and we don't, we don't need to be working overnight. We really just need someone to, you know, lead the fulfillment team. Um, how do we transition those really all-star players from the beginning of the company into roles where they're successful and happy long-term as we become a little more, a little more structured. And I was going to ask you who your competitors are, but it's a strange question, right? And, and I always think about the fact that, um, in microeconomics or price theory, when we teach it to undergraduates and just pretty much also to graduates as well, we often talk about a firm that takes prices given and it's for a particular quality. But of course, a firm has to decide. And, that, and then in that world, which is a bizarrely sterile world, in my view, and I think it's we spend way too much time in, in microeconomics teaching people about it. It's bizarre. But uh, in that world, your decision is how much to make, how many units to make. You choose Q. Uh, but, of course, the real decision that a firm has to make and the one you had to make was what's the quality – what's the market I want to be in? I want, In a way, you chose your competitors. You chose which firms to be in competition with, and you're not in competition – very closely in competition with the Costco T-shirt I'm wearing, uh, or the woman's version of it. Uh, you're in competition with other high-end, high-quality, uh, and with a narrative to tell about the production process that that makes customers feel feel good. Do you see people in that in that space that you view as your competitors? Do your customers let you know? Or do you find out? How do you do that? Um, that is something we think about quite a bit. I think we are a pretty unique brand and this, this kind of concept is still pretty new. The idea of shopping ethically or thinking about, you know, where, where your clothes come from. Um, it's not a, it's not an old industry. (laughs) So, uh, our competitors are certainly not the kind of large chains, I think there are a few brands. We, we know kind of where our customers like to shop um, other than us. They like to shop at places like Everlane, Eileen Fisher, um, some smaller brands like Jesse Cam, uh, A Piece Apart. We have we know we've got some brands that our customers like to support. Um, none of them are doing things that quite the way we're doing them. Uh, Everlane really focuses on transparency, but their things are still produced all overseas. Um, same thing for, for Eileen Fisher. Some of them are domestically produced, but nobody's doing this made to order lean in-house method. Um, there are much smaller brands kind of cropping up now that do this. Um, and there are a few denim brands that have taken over factories in the South and are trying to bring back this kind of heritage concept, but we're really in kind of a unique space. And I don't know that we have any direct, really direct competitors who are doing what we're doing and are selling to our, to our market. I think that's both good and bad. Um, I think it would be nice to have some other kind of players in the field um, in terms of like networking and collaborating and kind of looking and seeing other people's playbooks. There isn't really much to go on here. We're just kind of inventing, inventing this model (laughs) as we go. Yeah, Um, that's, um, I just want to say uh, H&M is not one of your direct competitors and I, I, I've never heard of them, but I suspect Polyvore is also not one, but in searching mm-hmm. for uh, a silk tunic to compare to your silk tunic, I now uh, foolishly did that and now have uh, Google ads popping <laughs> up in my Google searches for those products. But we're, we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's talk about this post you wrote, which was really um, so uh, both provocative, in, introspective, and and just really interesting as an economist to read it. Uh, you start off by talking about how pricing in the clothing industry has really changed dramatically and how customers view price has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. So what what has happened there? Um, pricing for apparel has really just plummeted. Uh, I, I don't go into much of the reasoning behind why that's happened. I think uh, I don't quite have the the knowledge to speculate on, on precisely why the shift has occurred. But essentially from the 90s to today, clothing has not only failed to increase in price with other consumer products, but it has actually it has actually dropped. So individual garment prices have dropped while other consumer product prices have steadily inclined uh, or increased. Yeah. And um, 
uh, in addition to that, the percentage of disposable income that consumers are willing to spend on clothing is, is dropping as well. So the clothes themselves are getting cheaper and the amount of money we're willing to spend on clothing is, is, is dropping. Um, so what that has led to is the kind of response from, from department stores and brands. Uh, they're saying that if, if we're going to be able to continue to sell you products, we need to, to make them extremely affordable so that you can take that limited budget you've got for clothing and make it go a, a long way. So, um, it's just been kind of a race to the bottom uh, as brand forever 21, I think was one of the big first players to come in to this scene and, and make kind of obscenely low price clothing. And then everybody struggled to kind of catch up. Uh, they forever 21 came out with, in the beginning, things were between 20 and $40 a pop. So jeans, you know, $20, so coat $40. Um, and then everybody just kind of jumped on the bandwagon. The H and M's developed and, uh, then department stores started to kind of join, join that that trend, and now of course you can go into Walmart or Costco and buy you know a five dollar shirt. But um, other brands that used to be moderate, not high end, but you know moderately priced, modern kind of Americana brands like Gap and J Crew, um, those aren't expensive brands, but for for an average shopper, those are pretty pretty kind of standard. Uh, but their prices have now started to drop as well. They're kind of becoming depressed. Um, with the rest of the market. So you used to spend a hundred dollars on jeans at gap. Now they're 40 dropping down into the thirties. And I think we're just kind of seeing this, this real race to the bottom. Um, as customers are saying, we're not, we're not willing to spend, uh, more than X on, on a garment. Yeah. I, I would include, I assume old Navy is in that group, which is oh, yeah. a store I've been in, which, is, <laughs> which <laughs> makes it distinctive from most of the others that you mentioned. Uh, I've, I think I've been in the I've been in the Gap, yes, and I've, I've even purchased something there. And uh, but, but my kids uh, have shopped in Old Navy, I know, and um, and and purchased clothing there. You know, I think I think what has happened uh, to give an economist perspective, and it's um, it's fascinating to hear it from your side. It, first, it reminds me uh, of a, a comment I may have mentioned here before from a egg producer. I once talked to who was in his 70s or 80s and was looking back on the history of his industry, which had, had incredible productivity increases in the productivity of the chickens and in the reduction in the number of people involved in the process, the adding of capital so that uh, egg production now was was incredibly efficient. And uh, he sort of interrupted me at one point and said, you know what the problem with our industry is? And I said, no, he said, too many eggs. <laughs> and what he meant by that was that the incredible pr- pr- productive improvements in the process uh, led producers to dissipate any profits they'd have made from those gains in the form of higher production. And all the gains, virtually all the gains, went to the consumers in the form of lower prices. And some of that's happening in the in the clothing business. And I, I want to let you add some footnotes and caveats, which you do in your piece, but – you know, basically opening up the world to clothing production rather than just the United States, letting clothing that's made in China come in without tariff, letting it uh, come in in a container, which is much more efficient than in a box or a pile or uh, something else. The ability to literally to containerize uh, output from around the world and move it fairly cheaply now without uh, barriers and move production anywhere in the world without barriers as as economic systems outside the United States, such as Southeast Asia and, and China, became available as places to produce stuff, lowered the price, price dramatically and gave consumers a lot more choice and, and it meant they didn't have to spend as much. So from the consumer perspective, there's a lot of good things about it. Now, it doesn't, it's not as, cheap as it looks, as you point out, and I, I'll, I'll let you talk about that in a sec, but I think the uh, what's extraordinary about the last 25 years, and this is true, of course, in many, many areas, is that I have, I have lots of choice now. I can buy a $10 shirt, and I can buy a, a $50 shirt, and I can buy a $250 shirt, and I can choose the quality I want in terms of how long it lasts, and of course, the $10 shirt 
it lasts remarkably long for a $10 shirt, but it doesn't last as long as the $250 shirt. So talk about some of the additional, some of the issues that you see as, as relevant in why a person might want to pay a premium. And um, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, I think um, that's kind of a, a great perspective on it. I think the, the sheer existence of a $10 shirt now makes the decision to buy the $250 shirt a much harder decision to make. Um, even, if, even if you really have interest in the $250 product, the, the, the simple existence of um, something that's so much more affordable, you really have to give that quite a bit of thought and, and understand your justifications for, for spending more money on that. Um, I think uh, something that's really kind of been lost with this shift in price is the kind of concept of brand building. Um, I think people are simply looking for product at that price point, at, you know, at the $10 price point, I think you are looking for, you're looking for a physical product. I don't think you're looking to buy into a brand or buy into an experience. Um, I think even kind of in, in the nineties, I think people were still feeling a little bit of connection to the kind of business they were they were participating in. Um, I think now when you go into an H and M, you are absolutely not thinking about the store you're in. You're thinking about the thing that you're putting in the bag. Um, and I think that just like you said, those, those companies have been able to offer the prices that they can offer because they've essentially passed every dollar of savings onto the consumer rather than investing in, um, in marketing or in kind of a building up of a community or kind of a, a culture lifestyle around the brand. They're literally, just producing product and, oh, yeah. and selling it at it the, shirts. you know, the, the, the minimum, the minimum price. Um, so I think we've lost a little bit of that kind of buy into a lifestyle or culture or community there because all of the savings have been passed on. Um, I think that's something that we try really hard to do is kind of build that culture and build that community, not just for our staff, but for our customers as well. Yeah. I think the other thing to remember, which is hard to remember is that, the workers who were in the factory that made that ten dollar shirt have a much less pleasant life and experience doing that than your workers. We're going to talk about your production process in a little more detail, which is extremely interesting to me. Um, but of course, their opportunities and alternatives are vastly inferior to your seamstresses and sewers, alternate cutters, alternatives, and. Incredibly, I mean, it's not obvious that this would happen, and I think most people have trouble believing it. But a lot of the people who work in the garment factories in China, Indonesia, Vietnam, et cetera, have much better lives than they had 20 years ago, even though they're making a $10 shirt. Now, their lives are not very great, certainly aren't great by Western or American standards, but they're better, which is surprising. So the, the companies that that are always looking for a competitive edge and are producing a commodity without the stuff surrounding it that you produce, uh, they've still been forced to give some of those gains to their workers because they have to compete for them. There aren't enough to go around. As th When you make $10 shirts, you sell a lot of them. And so uh, the expansion of of output is, has increased the demand for workers in those in those countries. The other thing we have to remember is that a lot of poor people, a $10 shirt's a blessing that's unimaginable. Uh, we're lucky to live in a really wealthy country that can afford a $180 shirt and or $90 shirt. And um, it's a great thing. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's just not the way of human history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think <laughs> that is a conversation that we engage in quite often um, internally and with our customers as well. It's a really, really sticky subject. Um, and this is kind of true of really any Western involvement or Western production in developing countries. See this kind of the, the vicious cycle of, you know, are we adding value there or are we adding enough value there or, or is, um, would it be worse to simply n not be involved at all and not provide any jobs is a bad job better than no job. Um, I think those are all questions that are really, really important. I absolutely do not have the answer. Uh, I think our our primary purpose here is to advocate for intentionality and, and consciousness in consumption. Um, so 
accessibility and affordability are huge. I know we are very, very much um, in a niche market here where most shoppers cannot afford to, to purchase clothing from us. Um, if you're looking at the kind of the average, even the U S average. Um, but even if you can't afford to shop from a brand like ours, I think our primary objective is to encourage people to be consuming a little bit more mindfully. Um, you may very well need to, to buy the, the $10 t-shirt. It may not be an option to shop anywhere else. Um, but maybe you don't need 10 of them. Uh, maybe you, you need one, you know, every, every two or three months you need, you need a new one. Um, I think we're really here to just advocate for mindfulness and just kind of reevaluating our needs as consumers. And, uh, I think the drop in price has created a kind of like subset. It's created this kind of subculture of particularly in, in, in younger generations of people who shop like they eat. Um, it's literally, it's like, it's like an activity, um, to go purchase things, wear them once or, or never wear them. And then either, either literally throw them in the garbage or, or donate them. Um, and that I think is, has a potential to be really, really damaging. Not, not a, even if you just, even if you forget about the, the kind of sad production conditions of those garments, but that's just not a healthy way to exist. Um, you know, as a person, it's not fulfilling. It's, um, it's not, it's not an introspective way to, to exist. Um, so I certainly don't have a great answer to the question of, well, you know, if we don't make $10 shirts, where will the people who work in those factories, you know, work, where will they provide an income for their families? (laughs) That's not your, that's not your job. I mean, I, I, what I respect about you is, and tremendously is that you're creating a product that's got a different set of attributes it's higher quality. It's made in a certain way. And for a lot of people, that's tremendously valuable. And, you know, as long as you don't want to stop somebody from buying the $10 shirt, I don't have any – I think I think it's great. And, and moreover, even though I'm as hardcore capitalist as there is probably, or in the top 50, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I agree with you about the shopping experience. I mean, I, I think our challenge as human beings – is to be given those choices of of the cornucopia of clothing and food and gadgets and not be totally consumed by them uh, and not buy them and then throw them away, not buy them for that quick thrill of getting a bargain or a new thing. I think that's very hard for most. I think that's our 21st century uh, Western first world problem. I mean, it's it's not a it beats starving to death, but it's still an issue for your soul. And I have I'm gonna make a couple of confessions here. I've got I probably have way too many of these five dollar Costco uh thermal undershirts made by Cool 32, which I really love. I have probably twelve of them. I probably could have gotten by with four and I could have given the rest of the money to charity or done something more thoughtful with it. Um I pass by it on my Costco run every two or three weeks and I think, oh, I could use another one. And there I go. And I should be more probably a little more thoughtful about it. Um, Right before you called, I was waiting for a UPS delivery of a new camera. And I'm way too excited about that camera. It gives me a lot of – it does give me legitimate pleasure, and I really love taking photographs. But I think any thoughtful person should be, as you say, mindful of how it affects our day-to-day life, our opportunity to have access to all this stuff and – I love stuff. It's great. And it beats not having any, but I think we should be thoughtful about it. Absolutely. I think objects, uh, objects are, are incredible. Um, and we're certainly not, you know, anti consumerism at all. We, we do <laughs> make money by selling products. Um, and I think that objects really do have the power to, to transform lives. S- silly as it sounds, the, you know, the Bose headphones I'm wearing, I was talking to my husband about them the other day and, they have quite literally provided me with hours of focus and peace. Um, and I think that we can sometimes take for granted the, the real value that objects can add to our lives. Um, I think that for me, the objects that tend to add the most value are the ones that are highly, highly functional. And I can see and feel their application in my daily life. And the ones that I can connect with the story of where they came from. Um, so, yeah, I think that the power of objects is, is really real um, and not it certainly is one that's not to be discounted. Um, I think when we're thinking about the kind of lower, lower price and 
perhaps not not always, but perhaps lower quality um, kind of range of of products in our lives. We just need to be evaluating what is their purpose, what is their function for me, and, and is it am I kind of making a conscious a conscious decision here rather than just a, a kind of unconscious, you know, eating the potato chips decision. Well, don't talk about the potato chips, but yeah, that, that sort of uh, convulsive, compulsive grabbing. Uh, so I've moved to a high level. My high level now is I know that I'm doing this. That's com- in a compulsive thing sometimes, which is a step forward. Before I would just be compulsively eating the chips. Now I'm going. Hmm, I'm compulsively eating the chips. That's a step. Uh, who knows what could be next? I'm working on it. And I yeah. also will say that. Uh, you know, I love your website, and I love the line of clothing. Uh, I don't wear women's clothing. My wife does, though. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, there, there is something very appealing about what, what you've created. And I want to turn to the uh, really interesting breakdown you did of the pricing of, of one item, which is your uh, – it's a silk tunic. You call it an artist's smock. And right. you sell it for $185. And – um for a non-clothing uh, aficionado like me, I, I might be tempted to say it's just a big baggy shirt, which it is, uh, but it's, it is it is beautiful. And the silk's very high quality, at least you tell me, and I bet that's true. So talk us through why that has to cost 185 bucks when I went, I did go on H&M's site, um, or I did do a Google search for silk tunic, and I found that H&M has one for 70 that I can get on sale now for 40 and it is 100% silk. But yours is 185 so talk about why it's 185 Yeah, um, so this is one of, our, one of our oldest pieces, one of our most popular garments. Um, we use a silk that we just recently, we had a, had a new um, fabrication developed just for us, uh, silk is measured in a weight. It's called a, a mommy. It's called the weight. It's M O M M E. Um, it looks like millimeter when it's <laughs> abbreviated, but it's not millimeter. Um, so we were using a 12 mommy silk and we just upgraded to 18. So it's, um, quite a bit thicker and heavier than what you'll find. And it's produced in, uh, South Korea. A lot of silks are produced in India and China. Um, and the milling in those countries is, uh, just not not as high quality as the silks you get from Japan and Korea. Um, so the fabric itself is um, a, one that we're really proud of. But essentially, our our cost is derived from the cost of goods sold and then our our profit. So material cost ends up at about thirty one dollars. That's comprised of the fabric itself. So we use about one and a half yards or one point seven yards of silk crepe to make this top. We also wash all of our garments. Um, this is a kind of small thing, but pretty significant for our brand. If you've ever had the experience of buying a cotton shirt from a store, take it home, wash it, dry it. It's a full size smaller, you know, than when you bought it. Um, that's because that fabric has not been laundered yet. We account for all shrinkage ahead of time so that when our customers receive a garment, it is going to fit the way it's going to fit forever. They can wash it and dry it. So that shrinkage uses up a lot of fabric. Most fabrics shrink, uh, 10 to 20% in length. Um, so we're using probably about 15% more fabric than the H&M tunic because we've accounted for shrinkage. Um, if you throw that tunic in the wash, it could almost guarantee you that it's going to shrink to an unwearable size. So um, shrinkage is a pretty ends up being a pretty big factor in our in our bottom line. Um, so we've got fabric, and then we've got trim, which is pretty minimal thread. We've got the garment tag, the care tag, the hang tag. Um, so all those go into the material cost, and we end up at about 30, I think $31. Um, and, and 74 cents, cents. yeah, thank you. <laughs> for the material cost going into that, into that shirt. Um, then we've got the labor cost. So all of our garments are as we said, cut and sewn in the building. So we've got um, a gal over there who she creates a marker, which is essentially a template that's laid out over various plies of fabric. Those are then cut through with a a kind of electric knife. Um, She cuts through the big stacks and then she pairs together the the garment pieces that go together to make one top. So, so she'll end up with, you know, she'll cut, do make a marker, lay out the fabric, do the cutting. She'll end up with 20 little individual bundles um, of tops to go into sewing. So the cutting time takes about half an hour to spread, cut it and bundle it. She's got that together. Uh, then it moves over to sewing. The 
this shirt takes between half an hour to an hour, depending on who's sewing it. A seasoned sewer takes about 35 minutes to sew. Um, our, we used an average wage of sixteen fifty an hour. That's an average of entry-level wage and then team members who've been with us for a while. Um, our compensation is based on the national average and, and what we think is just fair and realistic for for our demographic of employees, minimum wage in Tennessee is 7.25. Average wage for garment manufacturing workers is about 11.09. So we're well above that um, for our entry level, and of course we give annual raises. So most people end up well above um, the 16.50 that we use to calculate cost. So labor costs were about an hour in labor. Then we've got to press, wash the garment, dry it, press it, trim all the loose threads off, check it for quality, pack it, and label it. Uh, That's about 10 minutes in additional labor. So our total labor cost calculated at an average of 16, 15 hours, $20.89. Can I ask you a question? How do you ever, how often do you have to throw one out? Um, I I would say every week we have maybe two or three damaged garments um, and those go into our sample sale. So we hold in-person sample sales where we're able to offer things at a discounted price. And what, what would disqualify a garment in your I from being sent out as a regular? We are, we're pretty strict. Um, If there is any visible defect in the fabric itself, if there's a loose thread, if there's a a very, you know, pinhole, if there's a small oil stain, anything that's visible to the eye, we essentially say it's not going to a customer. But is Uh, something about the stitching itself? Is there an, is there an art to the stitching that's, that some people don't do very well or can't do well or occasionally mess up? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, if it's repairable, we'll send it back into production and repair it. Um, if it is irreparable in terms of, you know, there've been holes created by the needle that, that kind of, you can't undo, uh, we'll put that into sample sale as well. But we have, we do all of our training in house. Um, there aren't many industrial sewers in Nashville, you know, ready to hop on the line. So we are typically taking home sewers, um, or those with a little bit of industrial experience and are training them to sew our products. So it takes a, quite a bit for them to be able to sew customer orders. So usually sewing for a couple of weeks um, on test runs and samples before they're able to sew a customer's garment. Now you mentioned that you pay above the, well above the minimum wage, which is not surprising, but you also pay above the clothing person's wage of 11 something. Uh, yes. Do you have a lot of people want to work for you? Do you have a we, line? Uh, when you, when, you, when you go to hire someone, do you have a big do, Yeah, line? we do. Uh, we have a pretty large pool of applicants. Predominantly, they're interested in working on the kind of media side, the creative side. Um, we, do, we, we don't have much trouble filling our production spots, but it, it's definitely a, a more difficult job to hire for than like our, our media job openings. Um, but so far, we've, oh, we've always had more applicants than – um, individuals we've ended up hiring. So we've done okay so far. So we get, uh, I'm going to round up. Uh, we have a running joke here on Econ Talk that macroeconomists uh, have a sense of humor because we know that because they use decimal points. But when you say $31.74, and 74 cents, you've actually tried to measure with, with, with some real precision, which is necessary, what the tag costs. There's two cents, I think, for thread, and you've got all that in there. So, But I'm just going to round up to make it easier for people to hear the numbers and remember them. So you've got about $32 in material. You have $21 in labor for this garment. That gets us up to 53 bucks. Then you've got another 10 or 11 of wastage. Talk about that. Yeah. So this one is the kind of (laughs) the one that sneaks up on you. Um, In the beginning, we never accounted for this. Uh, But essentially, when you're cutting you know, pattern pieces. If you look at, if you look at a garment flat, the pieces aren't just rectangles. So when you lay those out on, you know, a roll of fabric, you're going to have some, some odd shapes and some strange angles. You're going to have quite a bit of wastage. So we try really hard to reduce that. Um, and that's our, our, the, our cutting team leader's job is to really minimize wastage in terms of how she's laying out markers. But no matter what, we've got, we've got a bit of fabric wastage there. Um, and then we've got some wastage in labor. So we're paying for, you know, 35 minutes to sew an artist mock, but we do pay hourly rather than by the piece. So we have to factor in for wastage during the day. Um, you know, someone's eight hour day doesn't mean that they sewed, you know, for eight hours, yeah. To 12, yeah, twelve point <laughs> five artist mocks day. You know, did a few and did um, had some break times in between. So we've got wastage there, and then uh, another big factor is 
wastage that accounts for an inaccurate costing estimate. So we might get a time from our sewing team leader um, of 35 minutes for an artist mock, but maybe they're, maybe they're not all quite sewing it that quickly. Um, maybe that was a, maybe that was a, an overly optimistic estimate, or maybe our efficiency goal is 75%, but really the artist mock's coming in at about 62. So we want to make sure that we account for any mistakes that may be happening in the costing process. So that we feel pretty safe with about a 10 or $11 estimate of wastage. That's kind of our buffer there. So one other thing about this process I want to share, which uh, which is so interesting to me. I'm going to read your quote from your blog. You say, um, we don't sew garments in assembly line fashion. We instead use a lean, full garment construction method. That means each seamstress sews a garment from start to finish. Despite it requiring more time, this improves craftsmanship, ensures everybody is learning and perfecting new skills, and is most importantly a more rewarding and fulfilling way to work. And we've talked many times on this program about Adam Smith and the power of specialization. And I've mentioned occasionally that that t- tends to lead to boredom, potentially, although if you're a specialist in pediatric oncology, it's not so boring. But in the production process, it can be. And you've gone the other way. It's obviously a little less efficient. You don't get the uh, the gains from specialization that Smith talks about, but you get probably happier employees and they get the pride in their work that they made the whole garment. Yeah. Uh, we really, really uh, have thought about this quite a bit. And there was a, there was kind of a point, a crossroads where we were trying to decide, you know, we're at a scale where we, we could probably go into a bulk production style and, and gain some efficiency there. Um, ultimately I made the decision based on my own personal experience. Um, and in kind of listening to our sewers talk about why they enjoy what they do here. So much of, so much of their um, sense of accomplishment and happiness is derived from, from knowing that they created something for a customer. And when you are able to do every step of the process and end up with a, a literal finished garment, you know, hanging next to your machine. And you know that that's going to a customer with a name and a child and a, and a story. Um, that's just such a different feeling, such a different level of satisfaction that you get from, you know, those hours you spent working on it. than if you sew 25 shoulder seams and you never really, you never really even see the finished garment, you never really get to see the, the fruits of your labor. So uh, I certainly think we could gain some efficiency by assembly lining, but I think, I think that in terms of employee turnover um, and dissatisfaction with the job, we may actually kind of end up at a break-even point in terms of efficiency of training new hires, et cetera. Well, to come back to a point that came up in a recent episode about, which has nothing to do with clothing, about drugs uh, and narcotics, and we're talking about the role of raw materials and, and in the final price, this is a $185 garment. The labor cost is... 20 to 30, depending if you include the wastage, and that's got a non-labor cost in it. So it's true that it's cheaper to make the garment somewhere else, but it's not, that's not, the manufacturing process itself, that labor content's not that big a part of the overall price, unless you want to sell it for 10 bucks, which case you can't. Um, but uh, it is, it's 21 bucks, and um, it's it's just, um, it's uh it's really interesting. Now that there's still a lot of, so we have labor material wastage that gets us to 63 bucks. We're getting perilously close to the H and M non-sale price of 70, but you're going to sell for 185. Where's that other $122 going to, going to go toward? It's not all profit. Contrary to what I think people often think, well, you spent, you had $63 a cost, so the rest is profit. Well, it's not. So talk about the other <laughs> factors. Yeah, that was a big uh, motivation for writing this piece. I think I'd heard um, a few too many comments of, uh, I could sew, I know, you know what it would cost me to make that shirt. And um, it's, just, it's certainly frustrating <laughs> as someone running, running a business when you hear that and you know that is uh, absolutely not true. Um, so most of that 120 left over, uh, our gross profit margin is going towards our operating costs. Um, we have a kind of interesting situation because we're essentially running two businesses. Um, most clothing companies are outsourcing all of the operations side of things. They're outsourcing all of their production. So they're, they have overhead as well, but their, their overhead is kind of, um, 
the overhead it costs to run a sales business. They need to market, go to trade shows, f- find boutiques, et cetera, um, shoot their product. So we are running a, a sales business as well, but we are also running a factory. Um, so we have two different kinds of overhead. We have the overhead kind of for our factory. We have a lot more square footage than we'd need if we weren't producing in-house um, equipment and ma- maintenance of that equipment and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have the overhead for the kind of the sales business. So we have to pay for the website upkeep. We have to shoot the product, uh, pay for all of our office staff and our, our media staff, our customer support staff, um, office supplies, just keeping the building kind of running. I, I would never have imagined how much money we'd end up spending on paper and pens um, just to kind of run a business. Um, and then, of course, design and research and R&D, all of those things co- cost time and money. So the big chunk of our gross profit margin is going straight towards our operating cost, just keeping the business going, keeping the roof over our head, paying the utility bills, um, paying the non-production staff, and then um, kind of keeping the operations stocked, keeping equipment up and up and running and all of that. And taxes is on that list as, oh, as, yes. <laughs> uh, as you've pointed out on the blog. And I want to, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but just one thing about the equipment um, in, in my primitive way i think okay you need scissors and you need needles to sew or maybe you have sewing machines uh what other equipment do you have what kind of how much stuff do the does the do the people creating the garment use alongside their own hands um that's a, a really interesting i've never quite thought about it from that from that perspective um it requires quite a bit of equipment so each each seamstress ha- or sewer has a, we call it like a pod. Um, so they have a kind of area where they've got all of the equipment they need to make a garment from start to finish. We would obviously have less of a capital investment for equipment if we were doing assembly line style. We didn't need um, each piece of equipment for every sewer. <clears throat> but since we do it this way, everybody needs a straight stitch machine, industrial machine, which sews a straight line, um, and then a serger machine, which is a machine that it's called overlocking. It, it wraps the edges of the raw fabric in thread so that they don't fray. Um, so they have their straight stitch machine and their serger, which are both industrial pieces of equipment. They're about 1500 or two grand a piece. And then uh, we have a boiler steam iron that can hold enough water to produce uh, high levels of steam for an eight hour day. And then they've got small, small pieces of equipment like scissors and pins, um, chalk, things like that. But the big equipment are the, are the kind of pieces of machinery, the straight stitch, serger, and boiler iron. And then um, that's just for the sewing side of things. Over in the cutting department, we have two large industrial tables. They're about 25 feet long um, that are really, really pricey to get in the building. And those have spreaders on top of them where you, you put a bolt of fabric on the spreader and you're able to roll it down the table back and forth and it will lay out the plies of fabric. Um, on top of one another. And then we've got our marker software. So the software itself is quite pricey. Um, it's a digital CAD software. It's, I think about, about 25,000 just to get the software in the building. Um, and then you've got training costs and all that kind of stuff. And then that software is used to print the templates that are laid over the fabric. So we've got a large format printer. It prints um, on paper about 60 inches wide. Um, and then we've got the paper costs. Every day we're printing, printing multiple markers um, to cut with. And then the cutting equipment, uh, we use large machine knives. They're essentially, essentially like motorized pizza cutters. They're called rotary, rotary knives that are, um, mechanized. They plug in overhead to plugs that hang down from the ceiling. And that is used to cut through multiple plies of fabric. So it's quite a bit of, of machinery used to bring a product to life. Um, and it, in an industrial setting where it's being used all day, a lot of it needs to be replaced or repaired pretty frequently. And you've got washing machines to... Oh, yes. At the end of the um, production cycle, everything gets washed and dried. We're actually right in the middle of replacing our... We have commercial washer and dryers like you see at the laundromat. Um, we're in the middle of replacing them because they both just just gave out. So two big industrial uh, machine sets. So how'd you find out about all that equipment? How'd you figure out what you needed? Um, eh, <laughs> um, that was pretty difficult. Uh, in the beginning, I just kind of invented solutions, um, before I knew that there was a company that made industrial cutting tables. Um, I would just build, build them. I would just, you know, go to Home Depot, buy some four by fours and plywood and build what I thought I needed to do things efficiently. Almost always I would then discover that 
this was already a thing that somebody made and sold <laughs> had, already, had already discovered was the best way to do things. Um, there's a website called fashion incubator that, uh, a really brilliant woman writes. She's, I believe in New Mexico. Um, and she was a pattern maker. I think she still is a pattern maker, um, in the industry. And she, I don't know what, what motivated her, but she essentially created a resource for people trying to start clothing manufacturing businesses and talks a lot about, the equipment required and where, where to find it. Um, I learned quite a bit from her site, but I mean, really it's just, it was just a lot of, a lot of Googling, a lot of research, a lot of kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, and then, you know, someone would say, Oh, Hey, I see you're, you know, you're using this rigged up cutting table. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't yeah. you get the real thing? <laughs> um, but it turns out that there are it's quite a bit of, um, infrastructure still in the U S there are quite a bit of, um, supply houses that still make this equipment and sell it, um, domestically. So if you, once you find a source, then they typically like now, um, we buy everything from a company called South star supply and they've got almost everything we need. So if I've ever got a question now, I just kind of go straight to them. They can usually point me in the right direction. And once they, you kind of, once you get in to the, to the industry, then it's a lot easier to, to find what you need. And if they improve something, they're eager to tell you and that's how you find Absolutely. out about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about taxes for a minute. Um, that sixteen fifty, let's say that's your starting wage. Uh, you said I think for a new seamstress or a new person coming in. Um, is that their take home or in other words? That, no, that could, is not their could take you home. have is that okay. the cost to you or is that their take home? Because you have all kinds of other costs typically a per, companies do of of unemployment and uh payroll taxes, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, that is a great question. This is a pretty simplified kind of summary of, of cost. 1650 is the, the average wage that we pay hourly to the employee. That's not necessarily their take home. They're going to be paying taxes off of that, but that's not, it's also not the exact cost to us. The cost to us would be a bit higher because we've got, like you said, payroll taxes, unemployment, that kind of stuff. Do you have other benefits you provide? We currently, we're in the middle of working on our benefits package this year. We currently offer PTO, maternity, paternity leave, um, vacation time, paid vacation time. We're working on health care. That's going to probably be the next one we roll out. And then ideally retirement will come in 2018. So to go back to our $185 tunic, uh, now I just want to mention that one other thing that some of those overhead costs, of course, are not, uh, they're what in economics we call fixed costs. Electricity, uh, your electricity is going to be pretty much the same. Not electricity, not all of it, but some of it will be the same no matter how many garments you make just to have lights on in the building. Uh, maybe not to run the machinery, but um, your some of your marketing staff, your non-production staff is going to be paid no matter how many garments you sell or make. And so part of the cost of that tunic is reflecting the fact that you're small. And if you quadrupled or tenfold increased your output, you'd have higher costs, of course, but some of your per garment costs would stay the same and you could lower some of the per garment costs um, of your overhead. So part of what your $104, $103 of operating costs are, are the fact that you're relatively small. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is absolutely true. This is a pretty, a pretty kind of, um, generic summary of, of what our gross profit margin is used to pay for, but it certainly is not, um, indicative of that. It, it doesn't mean that those costs will increase with every garment we sell or that necessarily $103 from it. We don't take $103 from every time a customer buys one of these and split it up to all of right. these. Expenses. But you kind of but, do, but you kind of do. And I think what, what's amazing is, you know, when you think about how an H&M can sell it for 70 uh, or something similar, they're, obviously their design costs are lower, but the main thing that they're, that they're doing is they're selling a zillion. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, and you can sell a zillion when it's 70 or 50 or whatever it is. And when it's 185, you can't. And that's your choice of, of where you are. And it could be the case, fortunately for you, it's not. But it could be the case that no one willing to pay 185. The fact that yes. enough people are means that you're a going concern, which is fantastic. But the bottom line is, I think we get down to $18.50 out of that 185, conveniently about uh, 10% to make the calculation sample is left over. 
for yes. uh, new things, reinvestment in the business, maybe adding healthcare benefits is what you're right, or maybe a new facility, some capital you could accumulate. So it's not a lot of money. It's kind of thin. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We are we are certainly hopeful that that exactly what you what you said is true. We are hopeful that as we grow in the next year or so, we will see those kind of fixed operating costs remain the same and we'll, we'll realize a little bit more net profit. Ideally, we would like to be able to pass some of that back down to the customers. Um, I'm pretty pretty happy kind of philosophically with where our pricing is at currently. I would like for it to be a bit lower, not, not much lower, um, but if possible, I'd like to get our prices down 10, 15%. So if we were able to see um, our costs shrink as a percentage of our revenue with growth, we would ideally be able to pass some of those back down to the customers, take a little bit more net profit in terms of, you know, building up some capital for a new facility. But once we'd, once we've kind of achieved those things that we're really uh, working towards, we would want to pass some of that savings back down. Just to come back to this point about your lower price competitors, they're relentlessly pushing every margin they can. So they've cut the labor costs dramatically because they're producing in a place where they don't pay sixteen fifty, they pay maybe three, uh three something an hour, maybe I don't know, maybe five in some places. They're using a lower quality material. Uh they're not worrying about where it's made so much. They only care that it's silk and it's cheap. Um and they've got those overhead costs down as low as they can because they're making a zillion. Um, and you – I, I want to give you a chance to, to talk about cost, what you call cost per wear. Um, for a lot of people, the clothes they wear are a statement that they're paying attention, that they are – they know what's in. You know, whether for a man, there aren't as many choices. It's the width of their tie or the cut of their jacket in a suit, um, the tightness of the legs of their jeans, maybe. There are certain things I just fortunately read that baggy jeans are coming back. Whew, good for me. Uh, but but it, but that's that's one way to think about your clothing purchase, a statement that I'm paying attention, and this goes out of style. So I don't really never want to pa- buy – I don't want to pay for quality because I'm not going to wear it for very long. The other strategy is to say there are certain things that are timeless, certain looks that are timeless. I'm going to invest. I'm going to pay a higher price per unit of clothing. And this goes way beyond clothing, of course. But I'm going to pay a higher price and because I'm going to keep it for a long time. So talk about how you think about that in terms of of your product. Yeah, that is a huge, huge um, element of the design process that we we work really hard to pay attention to. Um, In terms of cost per wear, I think – you can kind of calculate that by looking at two things. One is the actual physical durability of a piece of clothing. Um, if you buy a $10 shirt and the strap breaks after two wears, you, you've got a pretty pretty expensive cost per wear. You, may, you wear it twice, so it's $5 per wear. Um, if you have a higher price garment, but you're able to wear it, you know, hundreds of times over for, for many years, you could get down you could get down to a dollar per where you could even get into the pennies per wear. Um, and then you could go the other direction. You could look at something really, really expensive on the, on the high end spectrum, something that you're going to only wear to a few really fancy occasions. And you could be looking at several hundred dollars per wear for, a, for a, something like a ball gown or a, a really expensive jacket. Um, so the spectrum is pretty, pretty huge in terms of what the cost per wear could be on a, on an item. Um, we try to make sure that our garments are physically durable enough to give customers a good cost per wear value. Uh, ideally, we'd like for our garments to last between three and seven years. Um, we do not want them to last forever uh, because that means they're going to last forever in, in a landfill. Uh, we use natural fibers, which are going to biodegrade, which means they are going to abrade with friction. Um, they're not going to be, you know, everlasting. Um Pieces that are close to everlasting are, are not pieces that, that we feel comfortable making with polyester or synthetics. Um, but we also look at uh, style durability. So how, how likely is this piece to be out of fashion in a year? Um, and for that reason, we have our kind of year-round lo- long-standing signature collection that's comprised of pieces that are essentially trendless um, and don't really have a, a kind of date attached or a, a, a strong color story. They're all very co- neutral in color, simple in silhouette. 
you could see these, you know, you could see an image of someone from the 60s or 70s and they might be wearing something similar to what we sell. And I imagine that you could see someone, you know, 10 or 15 years from now and a pair of slim black pants would would not kind of date them. Um, so we look at physical durability to really, really give customers a best a best shot at good cost for wear. And then we look at style durability. Um, if something feels like it is kind of of the moment or trendy, uh, certainly as a creative, I, I'm not immune to wanting to participate in that. But um, we really try hard before putting a collection out there to eliminate anything that's got too strong of ties to, to the present day. My guest today has been Elizabeth Pape. Her company is Elizabeth Suzanne. Liz, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much. This was fun. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.